This DVD was created as a training tool for the humane care and handling of bison. It is not meant to replace hands-on training, but simply to complement it. Bison require periodic handling for testing and treating disease, vaccinations, dividing herds and separating individuals, culling in the absence of large predators, and translocation or reintroductions. They are very large, powerful animals, and any handling incurs the risk of injury to both animal and handler. The ultimate goal of any handling operation is to be completely free of injury and mortality. However, animals may sustain minor injuries such as cuts and the presence of blood on the handling facility may be due to only a few animals. Even when safety procedures and handling guidelines are strictly adhered to, serious injury or mortalities may still occur on the rare occasion. It is hoped that this training will assist in decreasing or eliminating animal stress, injuries or death while also increasing handler safety. All animal-based studies conducted by Parks Canada and the University of Alberta are subject to review by an animal care committee in an effort to ensure the humane and ethical treatment of all animals used in research. Bison are North America's largest land mammal. Two subspecies are currently described in North America, Plains Bison and Wood Bison. Wood Bison can be up to one-third larger than Plains Bison. However, a few other key characteristics are used to differentiate between plains and wood bison, most distinctively among bulls. Plains bison. The highest point of the hump is directly over the front legs. The front legs have large, thick chaps. The beard is thick and pendulous. Full neck mane, which extends below the chest and may reach below the knee. A sharply demarcated cape line behind the shoulders. Cape is usually lighter in color than the wood bison cape. Thick bonnet of hair between the horns. At rest, the top of the tail does not reach the hocks. Females weigh about 450 kilograms and males about 850 kilograms. Wood bison. Highest point of the hump is well forward of the front legs. Virtually no chaps on the front legs. Beard is thin and pointed. The neck mane is short and does not extend much below the chest. The cape grades smoothly back towards the loins with little of any demarcation. The forelock lies forward in long strands over the forehead. The hair is usually darker, especially on the head. At rest, the tip of the tail reaches the hock. Females weigh 560 kilograms and males about 1,000 kilograms. Bison are a long-lived species. Lifespans in the wild are often more than 20 years and up to 40 years in captivity. Both males and females reach sexual maturity at 2 to 4 years of age. While males are capable of breeding as yearlings, they usually do not breed until 6 years or older. Females usually are bred in their second summer and have their first calf when they are 3. The rut or mating season occurs from late July through early September. Gestation ranges between 270 and 300 days, and typically a single calf is born in May. As in cattle, twins are rare. The calf is born a rusty red color, which changes to a darker brown after three months. On average, females usually have calves twice in a three-year span. Wood bison have experienced a dramatic decline in numbers over the last 150 years. In the early 19th century, the wood bison population was estimated at 168,000. However, by the end of the century, overhunting all but eliminated them from their range. Only a few hundred remained. In 1978, wood bison were listed as endangered by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, known as Kosiwik. A successful recovery program led to their downlisting to threatened in 1988, after their numbers increased significantly. In 2000, their legal status was reconfirmed as threatened. Since then, their numbers have continued to increase. As of 2011, it was estimated there were just under 11,000 wood bison in 11 conservation herds. Plains bison are also designated by Kosiwik as a threatened subspecies. However, as early as 2007, they were not legally designated as threatened under the Canadian Species at Risk Act. Historical population estimates range between 30 and 60 million. 
However, by the end of the 1800s, due primarily to wasteful commercial hunting, they were very near to extinction. Currently, 95% of the estimated 400,000 Plains bison in North America occur in 4,700 commercial herds. There are currently about 700 mature Plains bison in three free-ranging herds and about 250 semi-captive in Elk Island National Park. The largest free-ranging herd in the Pink Mountain area of British Columbia is outside the historical range of this subspecies. The total number of free-ranging and semi-captive mature bison of this subspecies is just under a thousand in fewer than five populations. In 2003, 50 Plains bison were introduced to the mixed grass prairie of southern Saskatchewan on Old Man on His Back Nature Conservatory lands. In 2006, 71 Plains bison were reintroduced into Grasslands National Park in southern Saskatchewan in an attempt to restore the grazing regime that historically maintained the prairies and parklands of western Canada. In Canada, the greatest problem facing bison is the lack of suitable habitat due to the conversion of native grasslands to agriculture and urbanization. Additional threats include domestic livestock diseases, decreased genetic diversity, hybridization with wood bison and cattle, and domestication through commercialization. It is important to remember that bison are essentially wild animals and should not be managed as cattle, both in terms of safety as well as the process of domestication. Thus, while some commercial herds may be suitable for conservation herds, others are not. For example, genetically important herds, both those that are apparently free of cattle genes and those that harbor unique parts of the total bison gene pool, need to be conserved. This means developing best management practices and applying them to existing herds. Domestication is a process which results in the genetic adaptation of animals controlled by humans. It may be inadvertent or planned. Domestication does not directly describe how animals are managed. Wildlife are not domesticated simply by being raised like conventional farm animals, although over the long term that may be the ultimate outcome. Selection for one or more specific characteristics, such as rate of weight gain, muscle mass, etc., is often accompanied by unforeseen physiological and behavioral changes and frequently results in inadvertently selecting for a suite of unknown traits. Additionally, animals that are particularly wild in captivity are often accidentally killed or seriously injured during handling or selected for slaughter because they are too dangerous. This is active, sometime inadvertent selection for a more passive animal that may be an inferior competitor in the wild. Intentional selection is often equated with genetic improvement. Specific examples include traits such as docility, rapid growth and maturation, suppression of seasonal cycles to allow finishing any time of year, or market preferences for specific carcass traits. Selective breeding of wildlife in captivity can result in characteristics that are deemed valuable by humans, yet may not be advantageous or common in the wild population. Consequences of anthropomorphic selection may be shortened productive life and loss of hardiness. Ultimately, a conservation herd must produce bison that can withstand all stressors of a wild environment, such as predation and extremes in weather. Calving should coincide with the flush of new grass. A cow's first pregnancy should not occur before she has reached optimal weight and size for giving birth. This can take as many as three years. In the 1950s, concerns over the use of animals in research prompted Russell and Birch to develop the three R's principles. These have become commonly accepted practices for humane animal-based science. Reduction. When conducting animal research, it is essential to incorporate an experimental design that makes efficient use of animals. Reduction alternatives, suggesting methods for obtaining statistically comparable results using fewer animals, are preferred. However, one must keep in mind that it is equally unethical to use too few animals, producing statistically meaningless results after subjecting the study animals to sometimes invasive procedures. Refinement The goal of refinement techniques is to maximize animal well-being by minimizing or eliminating potential pain and stress. Stress may be physiological, behavioral, psychological, or environmental. 
It is often difficult to objectively assess animal pain or distress as many animals continue to exhibit normal behavior when under stress. Understanding animal behavior contributes to humane housing and handling for the species in question. For example, group dwelling animals, when kept alone, may experience stress and may do almost anything in an attempt to rejoin the group. A good rule of thumb is to assume that a procedure that causes pain or stress in humans will impose as much pain and stress in animals unless there is solid evidence to the contrary. This DVD focuses on the refinement principle. The safest, most efficient, and humane techniques currently used for bison care and handling are discussed in this training module to ensure the safety and well-being of both bison and handler while minimizing handling time. Replacement. This principle stresses the use of non-animal replacements in experiments when possible. Replacement alternatives start with improved communication about previous animal experiments to avoid unnecessary replication. Replacement alternatives also include, for example, the use of computer and mathematical models, organisms with limited sentience, and cell and tissue cultures. Finally, a fourth R should be the overarching approach to working with animals, respect. These four R's are primarily intended to provide guidance to people conducting research on animals, but are just as applicable to ranchers and farmers who strive to raise bison in a safe and humane environment. More recently, the UK Farm Animal Welfare Council had presented minimal standards for the humane treatment of farm animals. These are known as the Five Freedoms, and they provide valuable guidelines for both research and production facilities. Freedom from thirst, hunger and malnutrition by ready access to fresh water and diet that maintains full health and vigor. Freedom from discomfort by providing a suitable environment including shelter and a comfortable resting area. Freedom from pain, injury and disease through prevention or rapid diagnosis and treatment. Freedom to express normal behavior by providing sufficient space, proper facilities and company of like animals. Freedom from fear and distress by ensuring conditions that avoid mental suffering. With any free roaming bison herd, it is occasionally necessary to capture the herd for management reasons. The primary goal is to gather the herd together in a central location and gradually sort the group into subgroups. These smaller groups may then be sorted down to the individual. Methods employed will vary among locations depending on the size of the herd and the infrastructure available to the herd manager. Some actively chase bison from their summer range into a central holding system using horse-mounted riders or vehicles. This requires very experienced personnel and a facility designed with this technique in mind. Others entice bison by using feed or ungrazed pastures to move the bison from one area to another. With a captive bison herd, every effort must be made to safely contain the animals. If an escape does occur, Provincial Wildlife Acts often dictate that these animals are designated as wildlife and the provincial government acquires ownership. Check with your provincial government for details. Two approaches can be taken to capture bison for handling, using fenced enclosures to capture groups or individuals, or using chemical immobilization. In this section, we review techniques that bison managers can use to entice free-roaming bison into an enclosure for subsequent handling. Handling usually takes place in the fall or winter after the calves had reached weaning age. The methods suggested here are for a facility design and handling strategy which employs feeding and facility habituation as the principal means to move bison from their summer range into a handling system. The ability to use feed as an attractant is enhanced if capture takes place in late fall or winter, when natural forage is less abundant or less palatable. Bison are extremely adaptable to cold weather, and their heavy coat and fat layer predisposes them to capture related heat stress. Therefore, another benefit to handling during this time of year is the lower ambient temperatures. The cooler the weather, the better bison are able to cope with the stresses associated with capture and handling. Bison experience stress when forced into a handling situation, and signs of psychological stress are similar to those presented by heat stress. They include an increase in the reluctance to move forward, 
an increase in frequency and intensity of interaction with co-specifics or people, such as attacks on subordinates, charging people, gates or alley walls, refusal to move when pressure is applied, aggressive pawing at the ground, loud explosive blasts of air through the nostrils accompanied by a loud hissing noise, and in the late stages of capture myopathy or severe stress, lying down and refusing to rise when provoked. Stressed bison will often move or stand with their head extended forward, mouth open and tongue protruded. This may be the result of a long chase, overheating or extreme mental stress. Regardless of the cause, the physical act of extending the tongue is an attempt to maximize air exchange through the lungs. Bison have the largest diameter trachea of any North American land mammal and they use this to their advantage by dropping the tongue out and forward to open the airway as much as possible. When the stressor is removed, or if they stop running, they should quickly revert to normal nostril breathing posture. If they do not, cease all attempts to remove the animal and eliminate the stressor. This will allow the bison to cool down or to physically and mentally relax. The handling facility and its associated pens and alleyways should be located within the pasture system. This allows the bison to move through the system when changing pastures and when coming for water or treats, such as salt, oats, or pellets. Habituating bison to the facility during non-stressful periods will make their capture much easier and less stressful. During handling, strategic placement of salt, hay, or other attractants will draw the animals into or near the pen. Positive reinforcement can be used to pair signals, like a whistle, with the feeding routine, which can then be used to lure bison. Once they have entered the pen, the gate can be quietly closed behind them. As each group is caught, a gate next to the pen should be opened and the process repeated. Bison can be very flighty when they realize they've been captured, and it is important at this point to minimize pressure on them. If the manager opens the next gate and attempts to immediately chase the bison through, the odds of success are reduced. However, if the gate is open and the bison are left alone, they will quickly find the opening and they will investigate it. Light pressure at this point should be sufficient to move the animals into the next pen. This is also the point where the manager can divide the group or segregate aggressive animals into subgroups. As subgroups are created, they are moved closer to the intensive handling portion of the facility. Facility design and the availability of pin options then dictate how the process continues. Ideally, sufficient small pin space should be available to sort and hold the bison in groups of four to ten animals until they are ready to be individually sorted. Leaving the bison in compatible groups for as long as possible reduces the stress related to isolation and ensures that cow-calf pairs are maintained for as long as possible. It is essential during the process that non-compatible animals be segregated as quickly as possible. As a general rule, if two or more animals are of different ages or sexes, they may not be compatible. Strive to maintain cow-calf pairs and then sort animals into age or sex cohorts. Adult males should either be sorted individually or placed in groups of adult males. Within the adult cow group, there will always be dominant and subordinate females. Dominant or very stressed cows can be just as dangerous to other bison or to people as adult bulls. Injuries caused by adult bulls tend to be crushing or blunt force trauma injuries such as severe bruising or broken ribs or legs. Those caused by adult cows tend to be punctures of the rib cage or abdominal areas which are more likely to be fatal. Once subgroups have been created, it is necessary to sort individually prior to entering the squeeze. Again, variation in facility design dictate when and how this is done. Regardless of the design, the length of time an animal is confined in isolation should be as brief as possible. The facility should be designed in a manner which promotes forward movement and discourages backward movement of the isolated bison. Always provide a place where the bison can move ahead and strive to make forward movements a positive experience. Generally, it is fairly easy to move a bison forward and very difficult to get it to move backward.
designing facilities for handling bison should take into account both the physical and behavioral characteristics of this species. A well-designed system will significantly reduce animal stress and risk of injury and make handling easier for people using it. The philosophy on humane and efficient handling of livestock is to work with the animal's natural behavior in facility design and animal handling. As always, the objective is eliminating stress, injuries, or death during handling. However, bison are a large, powerful, and sometimes aggressive species, and despite the goal of no injuries or mortality, upwards of 1 to 2 percent of the animals may be injured or killed. Well-designed handling systems share several common attributes, and they work with the concept that bison are herd animals and feel more comfortable being with other bison. Facilities should be within or adjacent to the bison's year-round rangelands. The system should contain smaller capture and holding pens with the intent to sort and separate animals by age and sex so that aggressive or large animals are not mixed with small or submissive bison. From these small pens, the bison are moved to a central handling facility. Here, they are sorted into successively smaller holding pens prior to entering the handling facility itself. A solitary individual can become fearful and aggressive, and as a general rule, isolating bison from its group is not recommended. Large-scale operations may have the entire facility indoors, while smaller operations may be entirely outside and exposed to the elements. Many different designs exist on farms, ranches, and government lands. However, they typically fall into one of two types. The first features a handling system that places the handlers on catwalks, which are raised above the ground. This permits the handlers to access bison contained in narrow, high-walled alleys that are not much wider than the breadth of a bison. The second type has the handler working at ground level outside of the alley. These are typically box shoots, about one and a half by two and a half meters, which are designed to hold more than one animal. The handler gains access to the pen through slots in the wall. This is the standard design in large-scale operations such as auction markets and feedlots. Grace, just like you knew where he was going, eh? <laughs> Whether animals are worked from the ground level or from above, circular holding pens and curved shoots are recommended. This curve design allows animals to move smoothly and efficiently through the system by eliminating sharp corners where animals can become jammed and sustain injury. Bison have a natural tendency for circling behavior. A curved chute takes advantage of this behavior. If the walls are solid, a curved chute also prevents the animal from seeing people or other moving objects in front of them. The curved single file chute should not bend too sharply as this may appear to be a dead end and animals may be reluctant to enter. Fences must be at least 2.2 meters tall, and they should be equipped with tow holes and grab rails to provide easy escape for handlers. In the intensive handling section of the facility, all fences, chutes, gates, and holding pins should have solid sides. This creates a visual barrier between the animal and any outside activity. Bison may be less agitated if they are in low light areas, primarily because the uniform lighting removes sharp contrasts and shadow lines. Solid sides not only provide darkness, but also the illusion of restraint. If they cannot see a potential escape route, they will be less likely to attempt it. A solid top on the squeeze chute is also recommended to prevent bison from rearing up. Conversion of an open-sided facility to a solid-sided facility can be achieved easily and inexpensively. As a temporary measure, cardboard or lightweight plywood can be used to enclose a squeeze chute or an alley leading up to the squeeze chute until a permanent solution to the problem can be implemented. The facility should be free of sharp edges and protrusions to prevent injuries. Gate tracks should be recessed into the chute wall to eliminate sharp edges. Vertical slide gates in chutes should be counterweighted to reduce the risk of dropping the gate on an animal. Hence, gates in drive alleys should be equipped with stops or tiebacks to prevent them from swinging out into the alley. Walk the system yourself with your head at the animal's eye level. If you see people or moving objects, install shields as a visual barrier. Look for things that can cause animals to balk, such as air blowing in an animal's face. This can be eliminated by altering the ventilation. Lighting is an important consideration for eliminating stress and facilitating bison movement. 
especially in indoor facilities. Bison tend to want to move from a darker area to a more brightly lit area. Lamps can be used to attract animals into a building from outside and then into chutes. Lights should illuminate areas ahead of the animal and should never shine directly into the eyes of approaching animals. Another option is to illuminate the entire chute system. This will eliminate patches of light and dark, which may confuse animals. Move ceiling lamps off the center line of the runway to eliminate sparkling reflections on the floor. Experiment with lighting. Slight modifications can have a significant effect on animal movement. For example, shadows, reflections on water, or shiny metal may be removed simply by adjusting the lighting. Check the footing for anything that might intimidate or distract an animal, such as drains or abrupt changes in flooring. Ideally, drains should not be located in areas where animals are present. Animals tend to back up and panic if they slip, which can result in injury. Thus, all walkways should have a non-slip surface. New concrete floors should have a 3 centimeter diamond or square pattern with 3.5 centimeter by 3.5 centimeter V grooves. Existing floors can be roughened with a light jackhammer or a grooving machine. In crowd pins or scales and in other high traffic areas, a grid of 2.5 centimeter steel bars would provide secure footing. In outside facilities, the footing can be a native material or gravel. As long as ice and mud and other slippery conditions are mitigated, bottoms of steel gates can be padded with lumber, cut tires, or rubber conveyor belting. Take the time to stop and listen. It is important to minimize noise levels in the handling areas. Animals will be calmer and easier to handle. Metal parts on gates should be padded with rubber or silicone sealants. High-pitched noises such as those in the hydraulic pumps or compressors are more stressful to livestock than a low-pitched rumble. Equipment should be engineered to minimize noise. Handlers should also be quiet, avoiding yelling and whistling whenever possible. If animals become agitated, allowing them to calm down in silence for a few minutes will make it much easier to handle. The crowding pin or tub is a circular pin about three to four meters in radius with a gate hinged at the central point and it's typically used to move animals from a holding pen into individual chutes. The crowd pen should be built on level ground and should never contain more than two or three individuals. When a group of bison are tightly confined, they may become agitated, goring and pushing those around them. Given sufficient room, bison are able to maintain the dominance hierarchy, thus reducing stress and conflict. Initially, leave the crowding gate wide open at the entrance to the crowding tub. They may balk if it's partially closed. The crowding gate should be solid to prevent animals from attempting to retreat. Additionally, it must have a latching system that allows the handler to move the gate to crowd a reluctant animal forward, but also to lock in place when pushed by the bison. Again, when working with bison, keep like animals together, work males separately from females, sick animals separately from healthy individuals, juveniles separately from adults. Work a bison cow together with her calf for as long as possible. If separation is necessary, reunite them as soon as possible if the calf is to stay with the herd. Forcing a group of bison into a single file alley will cause them to pile up and climb on top of each other. When possible, move animals individually from the crowd pen into the squeeze chute. Bison waiting alone in the single file chute often become agitated. They will stay calmer if they wait in the crowding pen with a group. If it is necessary to bring more than one animal into the alley, hold each one in a separate compartment, separated by a solid sliding gate. When restraining animals, behavioral principles should be used instead of sheer force. To keep animals calm in a restraint device, they must be calm when they enter. Bison will often lunge or leap when exiting the squeeze, and the facility design should take this behavior into account. Care should be taken to ensure that pressure relief valves of hydraulic systems are set to the appropriate level to prevent accidental crushing injuries. Several different types of neck stanchions are available for both manual and hydraulic squeezes. Each has advantages and disadvantages. There are vertical straight pipe stanchions that either travel parallel to each other or are hinged at the bottom and closed to a V-shape. 
This parallel system is mechanically complex and may be cumbersome when manually operated. The system also permits unrestricted vertical movement of the bison's head, which can pose a considerable risk for the squeeze operator. This style of stanchion is beneficial in that it reduces the risk of carotid strangulation and can be used with all sizes of bison, as it automatically adjusts to animal size. Another common stanchion style is also hinged at the bottom or travels in parallel, but contains a yoke-shaped opening which is placed at neck height. This yoke produces the unrestricted vertical head movement described earlier and is intended to hold the neck in a normal position of a standing bison. Ensure the yoke is large enough to accommodate the neck of the bison being restrained without applying pressure to the carotid arteries. This style of stanchion can be a problem when mixed groups of large bulls, cows, and calves are put through a squeeze. It may be suitable fit for a bull, but too large to hold a calf. Regardless of the style of neck stanchion employed, the handler must be very observant and watch for any signs that the restrained animal is in distress. The stress caused by neck stanchion strangulation is most often demonstrated by the animal becoming suddenly quiet, eyes or tongue protruding a slow collapse towards the floor, followed fairly quickly by death. From the onset of strangulation to death may take only a few seconds and if any of these symptoms are observed, the handler must immediately reduce the stanchion pressure. The front of the squeeze should have a crash gate to stop the bison in the squeeze and enable the use of the neck stanchion. The crash gate must permit a view down the alley as an enticement for the bison to enter the squeeze, yet be strong enough to withstand a full speed charge by a large bull. The obvious goal is to encourage the bison to walk calmly into the squeeze but in reality, many animals tend to lunge or run into it. If the crash cage is built too visually heavy, or if it completely blocks the forward view, it can be very difficult to get a bison to step into a squeeze. The squeeze must be equipped with a drop-down or hinged panel on both side walls. This permits safe and easy access to all parts of the restrained bison for injections and other veterinary procedures. In the event that the animal dies in the squeeze, one entire side of the squeeze should be hinged to open fully to permit removal of the carcass. This feature is also useful when the purpose of the restraint is intentional euthanasia. Whether using a manual or a hydraulic squeeze, it is important that the operator is experienced in its operation and knowledgeable on the species behavior. The squeeze must be designed to avoid uncomfortable pressure points on the animal's body. Use the concept of optimal pressure, that is, apply sufficient pressure to provide the feeling of restraint without discomfort or pain. A restrained animal should be able to breathe normally without straining. When using a hydraulic squeeze, excessive hydraulic pressure can cause severe injuries, such as a ruptured diaphragm or a broken pelvis. Again, ensure the pressure relief valve is set correctly for the restrained bison. The amount of time that a bison is restrained should be kept to a minimum. When moving, handling, or restraining bison, always watch for signs of fear or stress. Handlers must not only recognize these signs, but be able to interpret them and respond accordingly. Some subtle indicators of fear in bison are licking, blinking, huddling, circular movement, milling, a raised tail, backing up and balking. As distress increases, these behaviors become amplified and new behaviors emerge, such as labored breathing, frothing at the mouth, vocalizing, bulging eyes, running, pushing, goring, attacking, and sitting. The bison may also attempt to jump or climb out of its enclosure. If an animal is further stressed, it may reach a state of tonic immobility. Symptoms of this include lying down inappropriately and not responding to stimuli. At this point, the animal may be in shock. Remember, different individuals may respond in different ways, and that behavior is a combination of genetics and prior experience. If possible, the bison handling facility should incorporate a passive sorting pen where calves are naively and passively weaned from their mothers. For example, calves may be pre-sorted using creep feeder sorting gates and pins. 
These gates have an overhead rail placed at a height sufficient to permit the entrance of a calf, but which is too low to permit access by other animals. Placing high quality forage inside the creep feed pen will attract the calf into the separate pen. The creep pen should be placed beside the pens which are routinely used to feed the cow-calf pairs. Calves should be allowed unrestricted quiet access to the creep pen until they are comfortable going in by themselves. It works best if food is withheld from the group for a short time. When the creep gates opened, the operator available and ready to close it. Immediately upon calf entering this pen, an operator must close the entrance gate and move the calf out of sight of their mothers. Forced weaning is stressful for calves, but if they are visually separated from their mothers, the time until the offspring maternal bond is broken can be shortened considerably. It often takes about three days for the weaned calves to settle, and about two days for the mothers to relax. Following the breeding season, adult bulls usually segregate themselves from the main cow-calf herd. The operator should have an adjacent pasture available for them. Relocation of the bulls can usually be accomplished simply by opening and closing the gate at the most opportune time, when the bulls are close to it. With any large-scale bison handling operation, the bison that are most tractable and easy to work with will be the first to move through the system. Those that are recalcitrant or regressive will usually linger towards the end of the operation. If you encounter aggressive or stubborn bison, it is vital to remain calm. When your stress level increases, so too does that of the bison. The facility should have at least two alley exits, which are designed to permit the option of releasing a bison prior to the squeeze. One should be placed at the beginning of the sorting alley and the other roughly two-thirds of the way along. Having these gates and alley options will enable release of a dangerous, wounded, or highly stressed bison into a holding pen where it can recuperate. Depending upon the individual, it may be necessary to provide a companion of similar age and size to further reduce the stress. Often, when an individual is stubborn and refuses to age, it's the result of a previous negative experience of the system. Regardless of the cause, remain calm and keep your body posture, voice, and movements as soft and quiet as possible. Approach the bison from the front and make them aware of your presence. Then, as the gate at their head opens, move to their rear. You can use a flagstick, cane, or any other non-painful device to encourage them to step forward. Suspending a tarp that spans the width of the alley behind the animal and moving towards the rear of the bison will often encourage it to step forward. As a last resort, electric stock prods can be used to get a very stubborn animal to move forward. This may be a situation where an animal is in severe distress behind a stubborn bison, or where an added level of force will reduce the stress on a larger group of bison. If used, the situation must be set up in advance to give the bison every opportunity to cooperate. All gates must be opened and all handlers prepared to assist in the forward movement of the bison. Once all is ready, the tip of the prod should be applied to the large muscle mass of the hip and never to any sensitive genitalia area. Bison have excellent memories for negative experiences. They will remember the use of a prod and the place where they experienced it. So restrict their use to an absolute minimum to ensure that future handlings of that animal do not allow a similar path. If all attempts to move the bison forward have failed, it may be necessary to move it backwards. Empty any pins behind the bison and then calmly attempt to get the animal to retreat. Often, the bison will have been kicking the tailgate or sitting on its haunches against it. The opening of this gate may be all that is required to let the animal move to the previous chute or pen. You can then attempt to move it through one of the escape gates or into another pen or, if possible, forward again. If the stubborn bison is not equipped with horns or sufficient size to cause injury, it may help to add another like-aged bison with it. The new animal may then lead the stubborn one through the facility. With any handling operation, it is essential that all personnel are trained and familiar with the specific facility. Worker safety is a paramount concern and it begins with a safe and efficient facility but must be followed by a well-planned training session. All new workers should be provided with an orientation package prior to training. This package should contain a drawing or blueprint of the facility, 
with all pins, alleyways, and gates identified. The purpose of the handling operation, specific roles of workers, and a clear set of handling guidelines should all be discussed. Particular hazards or risks must be identified and mitigated. Adequate first aid supplies must be on hand and a plan must be in place to ensure that an injured worker is provided with emergency medical care. Potential hazards to bison must be described and a plan of action in place should a bison be injured. Large animal handling facilities can be inherently dangerous places to work and all personnel should have appropriate safety equipment. This includes such items as good quality leather gloves, suitable clothing for the weather, hearing protection if required, and good quality footwear. On handling day, the person most familiar with the facility and its operation should lead a tour of the system. Each worker's task should be described for all to hear and each workstation visited. This ensures that everyone understands the role of their co-workers and that good communication and cooperation between workstation is maintained. Should someone need to leave, this ensures that a trained substitute can quickly move in and take their place. An awareness of risks to the bison and co-workers enables everyone to remain vigilant and able to quickly respond to an animal or co-worker in distress. Each handling facility has its own unique advantages and disadvantages. One disadvantage of most facilities is the necessity of workers entering small holding pens on foot to move bison from one pen to another. This is when handlers are most at risk of being attacked by a dominant or an aggressive animal. As discussed in the facility design section, pins must have adequate and easily accessible escape routes for the workers. It is essential that people who are comfortable working with cattle from the ground do not think of bison as cattle. They are not, and they react differently. Only experienced personnel should work on the ground to move bison between pins. The handler moves within the pen to direct and control the movement of the bison and thus must always be aware of their body posture and location in relation to the herd or individuals. Loud aggressive behavior by the handler will often escalate fear and aggression displayed by the bison. It is imperative to keep handling as quiet, gentle and stress free as possible. When the handler enters a pen to move bison forward or divide a group, Correct body placement in relation to the animals is vital. Bison will move away when approached. The key is getting them to move where you want, when you want. A successful operation takes advantage of this and creates a situation where your movement, combined with the facility design, creates an opportunity for the bison to make the right decision. The job of the ground workers is much easier if gates are properly located, pins have appropriate numbers of bison for their size, and other handlers are strategically placed. With these factors in place, ground workers can focus on the group or individuals that need to be separated, using appropriate pressure and timing to move the animals forward. To move an animal forward, the handler must be behind the point of the shoulder. Stepping ahead of that line will cause the bison to turn back. Having the ability to place your body properly in relation to the animal is an effective way to move animals. Once bison are moving in the desired direction, it is essential to maintain pressure until the animal has reached its destination. At this point, immediately remove all pressure. The more times the bison reacts correctly to your pressure and is then rewarded by a release of that pressure, the less stressed the animal will become. If subjected to continuous pressure without subsequent release or reward, an animal's stress level increases and its ability to cooperate declines. Most people who have been injured by a bison during a handling operation did not see the attacking bison in time or had no safe way out of the pen. Ground workers must continually assess their position in the pen and relative to the bison. Uneven natural footing, accumulation of frozen dung, and icy surfaces or snow-covered ground could make a worker susceptible to tripping or stumbling, putting themselves at risk of being trampled. This is also the stage of the operation when many bison sustain injuries. Groups are often separated into narrow alleyways using heavy metal gates. Gates can be slammed on an animal, causing injuries to the hips, shoulders, neck, or skull. Experienced staff on the gates and the division of small groups into the alleys and chutes should help prevent these injuries. 
depending on the size and design of the facility, an armed pin sentry should keep watch over the ground workers, as well as for any bison that display an intent to attack. The sentry must be a skilled marksman, trained in killing bison, and be capable of making the decision quickly as to when to take the shot. The potential risk of injury to the ground worker by rifle shot is very high during a goring event. The sentry must aim for the part of the bison furthest away from the person being attacked. The primary goal at this time is to distract and stop a bison which is in the act of or about to gore or trample a worker. The rifle should be equipped with an open sight which permits a wide field of view. Telescopic sights should not be used as they restrict the view of the marksman and do not offer the speed of reaction provided by open sights. The sentry must monitor the operation whenever a worker is in the pen with animals and can only relax that vigilance when the person has safely exited the pen. Handlers working with bison in chutes or alleys must always be cognizant of their position in relation to the animal. If the handler wants the bison to move forward, they should approach from the front, walk quietly past the animal's shoulder, and then apply light pressure to move it ahead. Approaching from behind, and applying pressure to the rear of the bison without warning tends to create resistance. The unexpected use of force from behind escalates the bison's defense reaction rather than the desired flight response. Bison which perceive an attack from behind will almost always try to turn and defend themselves with their head and horns. Bison that can anticipate what's coming and are given the opportunity to move ahead are typically willing to do so to escape the pressure. In every encounter with a bison, the starting point for moving the animal is minimal force or pressure. If that fails, try another equally gentle technique. Only if this fails should the level of pressure be increased. Force can be categorized into three appropriate levels of pressure, light, moderate, and heavy. During light pressure, handlers are standing or moving slowly and quietly, encouraging movement with a quiet voice used to alert the bison to their presence. During moderate pressure, handlers are moving aggressively, running and waving their arms. They may use loud voices, yelling or whistling, and may use flag sticks, livestock canes, rattles, or other noisemakers. Heavy pressure should only be used when repeated attempts at light or moderate pressure fail. In this case, handlers might use mechanized equipment such as trucks, all-terrain vehicles, or tractors to chase or push bison. This may include the use of electric cattle prods to force bison to move away from pain. If managers frequently resort to heavy pressure for moving bison, strong consideration should be given to redesigning the pins and alleyways so that light or moderate pressure will be more effective. Current Canadian Food Inspection Agency regulations require that all bison which leave their place of birth must have a radio frequency identification or RFID tag applied. They are numbered within a specific numeric sequence and are for use in bison only. These tags are permanent and upon the animal's death must be officially retired to the Canadian Identification Agency. This system ensures efficient tracking in the event that a disease is discovered when the animal passes through a provincial or federal slaughter facility or in the event of an on-site death. While there is no official requirement to ear tag bison on the owner's property, most producers do so to assist them in their daily care and handling operations. The ear tag should be durable plastic and should have a number that is visible from a distance. The size, shape, and placement of the tags should allow the animal to exhibit normal behavior. Tags that project from the body may impair physical activity or cause entanglement in other things. Ear tags should only be applied to a bison that is fully restrained in a squeeze with the neck stanchion secured. Work hygienically. Ensure the tags and tag applicator are clean. Once the tag is loaded in the applicator, it may be advisable to dip the tag and applicator jaws in an antiseptic or disinfectant solution, such as a weak iodine solution or betadine. Apply the tag near the center of the bottom edge of the ear, leaving about one-third of the tag length as clearance from the edge of the ear. The larger piece of tag should be on the inside of the ear so the identification number is clearly visible. If necessary, further secure the head of the animal to avoid tearing the ear. Close the applicator quickly and firmly. Ensure that it completely clinches the ear tag. At the time of tagging, record the tag number, age, gender, 
and if applicable, the registered name and registration number of the animal. Also record the owner's name and address and the date the tag is applied to the animal. If the tag is broken off but the ear is intact, reapply the tag avoiding the hole from the previous tag. When re-tagging bison, immediately update your records with the new identification information. During fall or early winter, bison may be tested for pregnancy using palpation or ultrasound examination via the rectum. These procedures should only be done by a qualified veterinarian or veterinary technician and only when absolutely necessary. Pregnancy testing is best suited for habituated bison that are often handled. Cows sold through auction or shown at competitive shows and sales are often tested to assure the buyer that she is bred. Few farms or ranches routinely test their bison cows for pregnancy due to the high cost, stress and increased risk of injury to the animal. Another method to determine pregnancy is the test for hormones in blood or feces. Multiple feces samples from a cow are required for analysis. These methods require laboratory analysis which may take several days or weeks for results. Consult your local veterinarian for details on where this service is available. Several safety concerns must be addressed when testing bison for pregnancy using palpation. Safety of the palpator is paramount. The palpator must be able to safely enter the squeeze and gain access to the cow's anal opening. This requires an easily accessible escape route and secure restraint of the cow. Most commercially available squeezes are designed to accommodate a palpation cage at its tail end, through which the palpator gains access to the cow. Some palpation cages have a horizontal bar which flips down behind the cow, between the tail and the top of the hocks. This bar is intended to provide the veterinarian with some protection from the cow kicking or suddenly charging backwards. Ensure there is no risk of the palpator's arm being broken on the bar should yes. the animal go down while their arm is inside the cow. About five months. If the squeeze is located outdoors during cold weather temperatures, a warm building or vehicle must be close by to allow the palpator to keep their exposed arm from freezing, to keep water and other liquids warm, and to permit cleanup after the examination. The collection of blood is a vital component of any bison handling operation. Blood is used for disease testing and is required when moving bison from one jurisdiction to another. Blood is also used to determine parentage, to certify genetic purity, for registration purposes, and for research. Blood may be safely collected from two locations, either from the jugular vein in the neck or the coccygeal or tail vein, which travels along the underside of the tail. If more than a few cc's of blood are required, the jugular vein is recommended. Gaining access to the jugular vein requires that the animal's head and neck be securely immobilized. This may require the use of a rope around the horns or a bison halter, either of which are tied off to a secure post. The goal is to limit the range of motion of the head and neck so that the blood sample may be safely withdrawn. Collecting blood from the tail vein tends to be safer than from the jugular. However, the tail vein is thin and delicate and often collapses after just a few cc's of blood are collected. This can result in red blood cell damage. Additionally, a new collection site must be found and may cause problems when conducting a tuberculosis or TB test. The skin along the underside of the tail is thin and soft and is the preferred location for this test. If numerous punctures are made while attempting to obtain blood, this may cause difficulty when interpreting results of the TB test. A needle and syringe system instead of vacuum tubes allows for better control of negative pressure which helps prevent vein collapse. During winter blood collection, it is important to ensure that the collection vials are warm before being filled to minimize sample damage. This can be achieved by placing the empty vials inside a parka or simply warming them with your bare hands. Once full, a safe storage system for blood vials must be available to ensure the samples do not freeze. Blood collection procedures will generate biohazardous material. Needles, syringes, broken vials, and any blood-soaked material must be safely disposed of in an appropriate sharp container. This will ensure that no accidental needle punctures or cross-contamination of blood occurs. Your veterinarian can safely dispose of the contents of a sharps container. As members of the bovid family, bison are susceptible to many of the diseases that affect cattle. If bison come into close contact with diseased cattle, they may contract a disease via nose-to-nose -nose contact, airborne transmission, or exposure to byproducts such as feces or placenta. 
They can even be infected if grazing on contaminated pasture. Vaccinations can be given to reduce the risk of disease transmission. It should be noted there are no vaccinations available which are designed specifically for bison. They've all been developed for cattle and later adopted by the bison ranching industry. Labeling details such as drug withdrawal times, injection sites, and methods of application must be understood prior to vaccinating animals. In some jurisdictions, producers are not permitted to inject drugs and must have a veterinarian on site to perform these procedures. Check with your local veterinarian to determine local regulations. The producer should consult with a veterinarian to fully understand the effects of the drug. The person injecting the drug should wear latex or nitrile surgical gloves to prevent accidental drug absorption through the skin. Most drugs are delivered through either subcutaneous or intramuscular injection to a securely restrained bison. For subcutaneous injections, the handler should pinch a fold of skin along the side of the rib cage or shoulder, where it's often the loosest, and carefully slip the needle through the hair and skin, placing the point of the needle into the fold. Care must be taken that the needle does not pass through the fold to prevent accidental injection of the handler, and to ensure that the bison gets the prescribed dosage. When injecting, also ensure your hand is not placed between the animal and a hard surface where it's at risk of being crushed. Once inserted, the plunger should be pulled back slightly to ensure the needle is not seated in a blood vessel before carefully injecting the drug. If you see a swirl of blood enter the syringe when you pull back on the plunger, you have entered a blood vessel. Reposition and try again until no blood appears. Once the needle is withdrawn, avoid touching the injection site. To avoid self-puncture, exercise caution when recapping the needle. For intramuscular injections, it is advisable to select the largest muscle available. This is usually along the top quarter of the hip, below the spine and above the point of the stifle. Two techniques are commonly used. The choice is up to the handler. Some prefer to pinch the needle between the thumb and the fingers, insert it into the muscle, and then attach the syringe. Others prefer to have the needle and the syringe together prior to insertion. In either case, drive the needle in quickly and perpendicular to the skin. Draw back to ensure the needle is not in a blood vessel, carefully inject the appropriate quantity of drug, and then withdraw the needle and syringe. A slow and steady injection is better than a sudden burst of fluid. This can cause excessive bruising and tenderness. Never inject more than 10 to 15 mils at one site. Record all cases where a needle is broken off inside the animal so that upon slaughter it can be removed. Needles that are not to be reused should immediately be placed in an approved sharps container for proper disposal. The handler should be aware that injection is a painful procedure and many bison will jump or kick when the injection is applied. Be aware of the strike zones and do not accidentally place your arm, leg, or head where it can be kicked or crushed. Regular monitoring of disease is essential to ensuring a healthy and productive bison herd. The producer should consult with a veterinarian to develop sound hearth health and sanitation programs appropriate for their facility and management systems. Care should be exercised when mixing bison with other species that may spread disease. If abnormal health conditions are detected, animals requiring medical treatment should be identified and treated. Detailed treatment records should be kept. Suspicion of a reportable disease, as defined by the Health of Animals regulations, must be brought to the attention of a veterinary inspector of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. It is important to implement measures to keep animals healthy. These measures form a biosecurity plan. This plan should address animal health and operational management, as well as access to animals by both humans and vehicles. Biosecurity is particularly important for threatened species such as bison, as preventing disease is paramount in protecting the national herd from disastrous disease outbreaks. Consult the Canadian Food Inspection Agency website for more information on basic principles of biosecurity. Two of the most important diseases affecting bison are bovine brucellosis and tuberculosis, or TB. There are currently no requirements to test bison for either of these diseases when they are being moved within Canada. However, there are permitting requirements for international travel. Brucellosis is a bacterial disease with clinical signs that include infertility, abortion, retained placenta, and to a lesser extent, testicular inflammation and infection of the accessory sex glands in males. 
Vicin contract brucellosis most commonly through contact with infected placenta or newborn calves or by licking contaminated genitals of other animals. Infection can be confirmed by a blood test. TB is an infectious disease also caused by bacteria. Infection can be airborne via the inhalation of droplets expelled from infected lungs or through close contact by way of feed sources. Generalized clinical signs of TB include progressive emaciation, lethargy, weakness, anorexia, and a low-grade fluctuating fever, while symptoms of the respiratory form include chronic intermittent moist cough with latter signs of labored breathing and abnormally rapid respiration. Diagnosis of clinical signs alone are very difficult, even in advanced cases. Currently, the most common diagnostic test for TB is the intradermal tuberculin test, but there may be several blood tests available in the future. Ask your veterinarian for more information on this test. Paratuberculosis, or Yoni's disease, is a chronic, contagious inflammation of the intestines. It is characterized by persistent and progressive diarrhea, weight loss, debilitation, and eventually death. Clinical signs rarely develop in animals under two years of age. Organisms are shed in large numbers in feces of infected animals, and infection is acquired by ingestion of contaminated feed or water. There is no single reliable test for detecting paratuberculosis. A combination of tests is often used. For more information on appropriate tests and management response, consult with your veterinarian. Malignant catarrhal fever, or MCF, is a herpes viral infection found in wild or domestic sheep who usually show no evidence of the disease. Bison can easily contract MCF through brief exposure to infected animals and should be kept segregated from sheep and other species that may transmit this disease. Clinical signs of the acute form most common in bison include fever, depression, enlarged lymph nodes, runny nose and eyes, erosion of the inside of the mouth, eye inflammation and diarrhea. Additional signs include crusty muzzle, reddened eyelids, opaque corneas and salivation. While MCF may be suspected clinically, confirmation relies on ancillary testing such as serology or histologic examination. Bovine viral diarrhea or BVD is primarily hosted by cattle, but can infect many other even-toed ungulates. The form most common in bison is transmitted through the placenta during the first four months of fetal development. Fetal infection can cause fetal mummification, premature birth, stillbirth, deformed limbs, and birth of weak calves. Large numbers of BVD virus are shed in the secretions and excretions of persistently infected animals. The clinical presentation of the acute form of BVD can vary greatly, from fever, runny eyes and nose, and depression, to diarrhea and respiratory disease. BVD can be diagnosed from the animal's history, clinical signs, serological testing, and gross and microscopic lesions in diseased animals. Anthrax, caused by spore-forming bacteria, is an acute disease that can infect almost any warm-blooded animal, although it is considered primarily a disease of herbivores. Most forms of anthrax are rapidly fatal. Highly resilient spores are formed after bacteria have been discharged from an infected animal or exposed to oxygen when a carcass is opened. If you suspect anthrax, it is absolutely imperative to leave the carcass undisturbed. Spores can remain viable in the soil for years and may start outbreaks when environmental conditions of soil, moisture, temperature, and nutrition are optimal. Wallowing, for example, can kick up anthrax spores that have lain dormant in the soil for decades. Clinical signs of acute form of anthrax include high fever and a period of excitement followed by depression, stupor, respiratory distress, staggering, convulsions, and death. The paracute form is characterized by staggering, labored breathing, trembling, collapse, convulsive movements, and death. Diagnosis of anthrax usually occurs as a result of finding one or more animals suddenly dead on pasture. Consult your veterinarian for advice on testing for anthrax as special precautions are necessary. Anthrax is a reportable disease in Canada, and if it is suspected, contact your district veterinarian immediately and have them contact the Canadian Food Inspection Agency representative nearest you. 
your veterinarian should be familiar with the signs and symptoms of the above diseases, as well as other diseases which may be of concern in your area. If you suspect your animals have contracted a disease, seek qualified veterinary assistance as soon as possible for your safety as well as to limit both the spread and severity of the outbreak. All bison will host some parasites in their life. Typically, these parasites will occur in low numbers, causing little or no harm to the host. Gut parasites, such as nematodes or roundworms and cestodes or tapeworms, are the most common. Adult worms lay eggs and then are expelled by the bison's feces. The eggs hatch on the ground, develop into larvae, and the larvae then migrate into the surrounding vegetation. Here they develop into the infective stage and are ingested with the vegetation during grazing. Prevention is preferable to treatment. The most effective way to mitigate parasite loads in bison is to ensure they do not ingest the parasite in the first place. The best way to do this is through frequent harrowing of non-native pastures, pasture rotation, or by following a grazing regime that avoids overgrazing. Harrowing breaks up manure pats and facilitates the desiccation of the eggs and larvae. A pasture heavily contaminated by manure will provide an ideal source of internal parasites. Appropriate animal stocking rates and a rotational pasture system are highly recommended. Occasionally, when an animal is experiencing extended periods of stress, these parasites may become pathogenic. Many bison operators have a routine anti-parasitic or deworming program to ensure that animals are maintained at optimal health. Dewormers can be administered in several different ways, either orally through diet supplements, externally through pour-on liquid, or via injectable drug. A dietary supplement is the least invasive method of administering dewormer, but is also the least reliable. An aggressive animal can dominate the feed supply and consume the entire dose for the group, leaving nothing for the others. Pour-on dewormers are applied through the hair and the skin of the bison as it walks through a chute. Bison have ten times the hair follicles per skin area of domestic cattle, and thus, to ensure efficacy, the handler must be diligent to press the dispenser nozzle tight to the skin to ensure the dewormer penetrates through the hair. Handlers should always wear disposable gloves to protect themselves when using a pour-on product. Some producers employ a self-delivery system of antiparasitic agents through the use of oilers. These are stationary devices placed in the field with the bison and designed to assist them in scratching and rubbing activities. Each time the bison rubs on the device, they receive a dose of dewormer. While this is a passive and safe means of drug delivery, there is no certainty that every member of the group will receive a prescribed dosage. Injection is the most reliable method for ensuring dewormer is administered to the animal. The procedures and recommendations provided by the manufacturer must be followed precisely to ensure the animal receives the proper dosage. Producers must be aware that any drug injection in a bison has a restriction period where the meat cannot be consumed by humans. Withdrawal times vary among drugs and if in doubt, consult a veterinarian. Genetic analysis may be conducted on a bison herd to determine parentage and certify genetic purity blood and hair are the most common biological materials from which DNA is extracted. Hair is the easiest source as the procedure does not require a veterinarian and it is the least invasive to the animal. For bison, removing hair from the cape or shoulder area of a securely restrained animal is recommended. Here, the hair is long and denser. Hair must be pulled and not cut from the animal to ensure the roots or follicles are included. The hair shaft does not contain any genetic material. To confirm the hairs contain roots and have not simply broken off, hold them up against a dark background and look for a wider portion at the base of the hair. To ensure an adequate quantity of DNA is extracted for analysis, a minimum of 20 to 30 roots are required per sample. Simply grabbing a clump of hair and pulling should provide a sufficient amount. Hair samples for genetic analysis should be stored in a paper envelope. Hairs are sometimes wet, and if storage is airtight, the roots may rot, ruining the DNA. If in an area where hair samples will not dry rapidly in an envelope, they may be placed in a plastic sample collection bag and frozen. Envelopes may be stored at room temperature, where the genetic material will remain viable for years. After each sample is collected, clearly mark the envelope with the date and relevant identification information of the individual from which the hair was removed. Contact a genetic laboratory for information on sample shipping procedures. 
If possible, split the hair sample into two clumps, one for DNA analysis and the other as a backup in case the first is damaged or lost. Bison in captivity must be supplied adequate quantities of suitable forage and access to fresh water. The methods used to feed and water animals will vary considerably among facilities depending on the local environmental conditions, herd sizes, and management goals. A general guideline for the provisions of feed is that all members of the group must have equal access to the feed at all times. In a mixed group of bulls, cows, and subordinate bison, the dominant individual will always attempt to hoard the feed. Dominant bulls will often feed first and then lay on the feed to restrict access by others. The best way to mitigate this is to lay the feed out in multiple locations or unroll round hay bales. This allows all members of the group to feed simultaneously. It is preferable for at least two people to be involved in distributing forage to the herd. One person operates the tractor to deliver the feed, usually in the form of round hay bales, while the other person cuts and removes the twine or wrapping from the bale. This is a potentially dangerous situation for the person on foot, particularly when the herd surrounds the bale handler while waiting for their feed. Pushing and shoving between members of the herd can create a situation where the handler can be injured. The tractor operator must watch and protect the person on the ground at all times to ensure their safety. They must also be aware of their surroundings so the person on the ground does not get injured by the equipment. Bison are supremely adapted to surviving long winters in deep snow. Their digestive physiology allows them to thrive for long periods without access to liquid water. When bison crater through snow to access forage, they ingest small quantities of snow with each bite. The combination of frequent small meals with frequent small intakes of moisture aids the digestion of forage. Bison enclosed in high densities and being fed large quantities of dry forage must have free access to water for their digestive systems to function properly. Failure to provide access to free choice water can lead to serious digestive problems. Once back on winter pastures where bison forage naturally, free choice water is still a good idea. However, if there is adequate snow available, bison can do very well without it. Transportation can be one of the most stressful events a bison will experience. Ensure that animals are transported in the most humane, safe, and effective manner possible for the benefit of both humans and animals. Vehicles and trailers used to transport bison should be in excellent condition and must be in full compliance with provincial highway traffic regulations, as well as the federal and provincial regulations governing the transportation of animals. Cattle liners are not suitable, as bison may bunch together causing injury. To comply with environmental regulations, trailer floors should be leak-proof to prevent urine and manure from dripping onto the highway. Animal behavior is a prime consideration during transport. A thorough knowledge of bison behavior patterns can significantly reduce the amount of handling and goading needed to load, move, and unload them. These behaviors include flight zone, point of balance, where to stand to make an animal move in the desired direction, parameter of vision, such as field of view, depth perception, color perception, and general visual acuity, probable responses to stimuli, and social behavior. This knowledge also allows a transporter to assess loading facilities, problems that may incur during loading or unloading, segregation needs, general fitness of the animals, and signs of distress in animals during transport. When transporting bison, they need to be in good physical condition and health. Those with reduced capacity to withstand the stress of transportation due to injury, fatigue, infirmity, poor health, distress, very young or old age, impending birth, or any other cause are unfit for transport. This includes pregnant cows, which are likely to give birth within six weeks of the journey, calves less than eight days old, and a non-ambulatory bison or downers. A system must be in place to identify injured animals during transportation and prior to unloading. Transporters and handlers should agree on a plan to deal with animals that become ill or injured during the journey. If an animal dies in transit, it must be removed at the first opportunity in accordance with provincial and federal legislation. If animals cannot be easily seen from the outside of the trailer, 
Each trailer must have a sign or symbol indicating it contains live animals. Ensure the trailer is firmly secured to the vehicle to provide stability during transit. Trailers must provide sufficient room to allow bison to assume a natural standing position with their head elevated without coming into contact with the roof or upper deck. Bison older than one year of age should never be transported in a vehicle with more than one deck. Trailer doors must close firmly and securely and have a tamper-proof locking system. Trailers should have smooth fittings and the inside surface must be free of any sharp protrusions or edges. Divider gates should also have latches that can be operated from outside the trailer. The floor of the trailer and ramps must provide secure footing. Wood shavings, sand, or secure footholds can help prevent the animals from slipping or falling during loading, transportation, and unloading. Provisions must be made for absorption or drainage of urine. Suitable bedding such as straw, wood shavings, sand with sawdust, peat moss, or mats may be added to the floor of the trailer. These materials will also help protect the bison from hard flooring and vibrations during the vehicle's operation. In winter, bedding prevents animals from having direct contact with cold surfaces. Bedding materials must be free from substances known to be irritating or harmful to bison or to contaminate meat products. It is important to note in certain areas, plant health disease control actions may prohibit the use of straw or hay. Adequate ventilation without drafts is an important component of trailer design. Ventilation and air temperature within the trailer must be balanced to meet the animal's needs and should be monitored throughout the journey. Internal temperatures and air quality may not be ideal even if outside conditions are. Care must be taken to protect bison from exposure to exhaust. Ventilation should be adjustable from the outside of the trailer in response to temperature changes during the trip. In hot, humid weather, animals require more ventilation during transportation to prevent dangerous levels of heat buildup. In high temperatures, loading density should be decreased by at least 10%. When a stop is required, the driver should take all necessary steps to ensure the duration of the stop is minimized to prevent heat buildup inside the trailer. Vehicles should not be parked in direct sunlight. If possible, excessively hot periods should be avoided altogether, and transportation rescheduled during cooler periods, such as at night or early morning. For trips exceeding 12 hours, the driver should keep the vehicle moving during the hottest period to circulate air through the trailer and to make the rest stops during the cool night hours. Periods of intense traffic congestion should also be avoided. Precautions must also be taken during cold weather. The load should be checked more frequently to ensure a suitable balance between protection from cold and provision of adequate ventilation. Alternating between warming and cooling can lead to respiratory problems. Extra measures should be taken to keep the bison dry and comfortable. Provide extra straw or other suitable bedding. Bison must be protected from contact with cold metal surfaces by lining the floor and sides with wood, straw, or other suitable insulating material. Although resistant to cold, bison are vulnerable to excessive cold under certain circumstances. In extreme or rapidly changing weather, bison should be inspected frequently for signs of distress due to extreme cold or heat. To prevent unnecessary stress and injury, great care must be taken when loading and unloading bison. The trailer and ramp used for loading and unloading should be safe for both the animals and handlers. They should have sides that are secure, strong and of sufficient height to prevent bison from falling off, jumping, or being pushed off the ramp or trailer. Trailer design must prevent exposure to any part of the animal to the outside. Doors and internal gates must be wide and tall enough to permit bison to pass through easily. Stock trailers that open the full width of the trailer are much safer than single animal sliding doors. Loading areas should be designed and located to permit transport vehicles to turn around and to enter and exit the dock area without obstructing public roads. Snow should be removed from loading areas and where necessary sand or salt should be applied before trucks arrive to load. Preferably the loading dock surface should be level with the trailer floor. If this is not possible, bison should not be required to negotiate a step higher than 30 centimeters. Elevated docks should be at least one and a half meters wide. Solid ramps free of any projections should always be used. 
never tilt the trailer. The slope of a ramp should not exceed 25 degrees. Docks and ramps should accommodate the different sizes of commonly used vehicles. This can be achieved by providing docks of different heights or adjustable ramps. Ensure there are no gaps between the ramp, its sides, and the stationary trailer to be loaded. In possum belly trailers, internal ramps should have solid sides continuous to the floor to prevent foot slippage off the side of the ramp. The addition of gates on the loading dock will help prevent bison going back from where they came. Loading into vehicles is easier if the alleys and ramps have no sharp turns that could impede movement or cause injury to the bison. Before loading any trailer, an interior inspection should be performed and corrective measures should be taken to assure safe, comfortable transportation. A good understanding of animal behavior and a careful, cautious approach by handlers will facilitate the loading procedure. Bison should be kept as calm as possible and should not be rushed during loading and unloading. If they can start the trip with minimal stress and excitement, the rest of the journey will be more successful. Handlers should be aware that bison can become excited by abrupt movements, noises, or flashes of light that tend to occur during the loading and unloading. At night, lighting the interior of the trailer may encourage the bison to enter. Uniform lighting in areas through which the animals will be loaded may help to prevent balking and reversing of direction. Contrasting shadows and bright spots may intimidate bison and interfere with their orderly movement. On bright sunny days, it may help to shade the loading dock. Facilities and practices must be in place to keep incompatible animals separate during transport. Federal regulations state that the following animals must be segregated while on the same vehicle. Bison that are incompatible by nature, bison of substantially different weight or age, except for a cow and her nursing calf, bison of different health status, groups of mature bulls. Proper sorting pins should be available for mixed loads. Bison over two years of age that are from different sources must not be mixed during transport. Bulls will often become aggressive with each other during the breeding season and cannot be kept in the same compartment. Mature horned bison must be segregated from dehorned bison. Prepare groups for shipment well in advance. Sort them into groups and allow them to establish relationships prior to loading, preferably for a week or more. Bison should be transported in a standing position with the option to lie down comfortably during extended trips. In planning a load of bison, consideration must be given to their sex, size, group size, trailer design and usable floor space. A useful calculation for load density is to multiply the length of each animal by their width and double that area. This should always be followed by a visual examination of the group inside the trailer. If the trailer will not be filled, bison should be safely partitioned into smaller areas to provide stability for both the animal and the vehicle. Most large vehicles are equipped with cross gates to hold animals in groups. Proper spacing will reduce or eliminate the potential for injury or suffering. Overcrowding can cause discomfort due to lateral pressure on the animal. Individual animals transported in overcrowded conditions may be unable to get up should they lose their footing. Handlers should also consider the effect of horns and winter coats and adjust loading density accordingly. Facilities should have a sufficient unloading ramp capacity so vehicles may be unloaded properly. Bison should not be unloaded directly into long alleyways. Use properly designed chutes, ramps, and holding or sorting pins. The unloading ramp should have a level area at least 1.2 to 1.8 meters before the ramp declines. Bison do not like to start downhill immediately upon exiting a trailer. On concrete ramps, stair steps provide better traction than cleats or grooves when they become dirty. Be patient during unloading. If given time, bison will often leave the trailer on their own. Keep in mind the bison's peripheral vision and keen senses and minimize human interaction. Often, bison, particularly mature bulls, will not voluntarily leave the comfort of the trailer. In this situation, use a sweep gate or divider to gently push the animal towards the open door. Use of electric prods, rattles, or tools of any kind is discouraged. 
Drivers should check each load immediately before departure to ensure that the bison have been properly loaded. Another check should be made early in the trip to make adjustments as required. The driver should check the bison for signs of general discomfort such as overcrowding or overheating. If bison remain restless and continue to scramble for footing, are noisy for prolonged periods, or lie down involuntarily and are unable to get up, this may indicate overcrowding. Bison standing with their neck extended and breathing through an open mouth may be overheating. Bison should remain dry during transportation. If they are loaded dry and are now wet, this may be another sign of overheating. In cold weather, frozen fluid on animals' face and nostrils could indicate cold exposure. Periodic checks should be made any time the load stops and adjustments made as needed. Drivers should be alert. Drive and stop with their vehicles as smoothly as possible. They should also negotiate turns in the smoothest possible manner. Avoid sharp turns. Drivers should practice defensive driving by ensuring that adequate space between vehicles is available in case an emergency requires an unexpected stop. Transportation time possesses a significant risk to bison. Even with a short haul of less than four hours, loading and transport of the animal is stressful. Longer journeys increase the risk of injury or death to an animal. Travel in excess of six hours may expose animals to significant environmental changes and increase the time they are exposed to risk factors such as heat, cold, jostling, and piling. Drivers must carefully plan their journey, including route taken, fuel availability, and potential offloading sites along the way considering expected weather conditions and route, including severe weather planning, location and contact information for vet clinics, Canadian Food Inspection Agency offices, stock handling facilities, and licensed officers with tranquilizers. Expected delays such as road construction, ferries, borders and scales, and unloading hours at the destination. In case of traffic accidents, breakdowns, or other unexpected delays, prompt action should be taken to ensure the well-being of the bison. It is now standard practice for emergency preparedness to have alternate plans in place and in writing. Drivers must be familiar with emergency plans and procedures. Bison should be transported from point of origin to final destination by the safest route that minimizes transport time. Records must be maintained to account for the time in transit and care given to the animals during all stages of the journey. While in transit, bison are subject to inspection under the Health of Animals Act transportation regulations. Maximum trip duration should be 24 hours. If this must be exceeded, bison must be fed and watered within five hours of departure. Particular attention should be paid to calves and lactating or pregnant cows. Federal Health of Animals regulations dictate that bison must not be confined in a transport vehicle for more than 48 hours without being offered adequate feed, water, and rest. Therefore, drivers must also take into consideration potential locations of facilities along the way, where the trailer is parked in a sheltered or shaded location, and bison fed, watered, sheltered, and cared for in a humane manner. On extended journeys, fresh hay and water or high moisture feed should be offered. Root vegetables can also be given to provide needed moisture or, if above freezing, hay may be hosed down. The 48-hour restriction may be extended only if bison will reach their final destination without having been confined in a vehicle for longer than 52 hours. The Health of Animals regulations requires that a rest period be at least five hours in duration. If bison are to be unloaded, it's strongly recommended that the rest period be at least 48 hours. Preferably, unloading of bison should be avoided. Nursing calves accompanying their dams should be allowed an opportunity to nurse undisturbed at suitable intervals. Nursing calves should be provided with appropriate additional feed and water at least every eight hours. Feed, water, and rest can be provided at a rest station or a suitably equipped vehicle. Pins at the rest station must provide adequate space for all animals to lie down simultaneously. Bison should be able to move freely in a well-bedded and protected environment and have at least twice the floor space as in transit recommendations. The environment must be free from disturbance, excessive noise, or movement. All animals must have the opportunity to eat good quality feed, 
with suitable feeders as well as free access to sufficient clean drinking water, which is protected from freezing. Again, adequate ventilation and appropriate temperatures must be maintained at all times. Sufficient lighting must be available for observations of each animal. When an animal sustains a grievous injury or debilitating illness, and recovery is highly unlikely, humane euthanasia may be the only viable option. Although an unpleasant task, it is an inevitable component of animal husbandry. Euthanasia will stop the suffering caused by severe injury or illness, or be necessary for slaughter for meat. Regardless of the reason, all efforts must be made to ensure that death is as quick and painless as possible. If the manager is not certain at what point the decision must be made to end the animal suffering, a qualified veterinarian should be consulted. Bison are very stoic and may not present obvious signs of physical pain. Experience and an understanding of bison physical anatomy are useful when deciding whether an animal can recover or whether it must be killed. Once the decision has been made, the manager must decide when, where, and how the animal will be dispatched. Human safety and animal welfare must always override economic considerations. For example, transporting a bison with a broken leg to a slaughter facility would be considered inhumane and preference should be given to an on-site slaughter. Many veterinarians are trained and certified by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in pre-slaughter inspection and for a fee they will come to your facility. The animal can then be slaughtered, transported to the abattoir and processed for human consumption. Several euthanasia options are available for bison, including the use of drugs or high-calibered rifles. If drugs are used, the carcass must be disposed so that it cannot be consumed by people or scavengers. Burial or burning are the two most common methods. If the bison is to be shot, it must be in a location where other herd members are protected from the rifle shot and where an accidental miss is not going to have any negative consequences. The animal should be easily accessible by truck, tractor, or hoist to allow its removal for subsequent salvage. If a bison becomes injured within the handling system, the facility should be designed to allow easy extraction of a euthanized animal. For example, side gates along alleys and chutes would aid in removing an immobilized animal. The decision to use a rifle or a shotgun has been investigated by various slaughter facilities and without exception, rifles are preferred. Shotguns of 410 gauge or higher using a solid lead slug are efficient and capable of causing instantaneous death, but only at close range, less than 2 meters, and only while the bison is confined to a knock box or other structure. Lead slugs or bullets have been known to ricochet if they pass through the animal. This may pose a risk for workers. Steel or copper jacketed bullets may also pass through the animal, but tend to shatter if they hit metal posts, rendering them less dangerous. The choice of rifle is often dictated by the preferences and experience of the shooter and the availability of appropriate firearms. Shot placement is critical, but takes precedent over caliber. The preferred shot occurs when the bison is quartering away. When standing in full profile, two shots are presented. If using a side head shot, aim for the posterior base of the horn. The skull is thin and poorly protected at this angle. If properly placed, the bullet will travel into the brain case and death will be instantaneous. If the bullet travels into the neck, often the spinal column will be shattered. If it pulls the other way, the skull plate will be destroyed. If the head shot does not present itself, a heart shot can be used. The heart lies very low in the chest cavity at the Kate demarcation line and 10 centimeters above the ventral chest line. Aim just above the intersection of the chest and elbow. Avoid shooting anterior to this point as it's where the diaphragm is located. While a shot posterior to this point will put the bullet into the stomach or lung and it will not be fatal. The shot sight line must be clear of any secondary targets on the opposite side of the animal as the projectile may pass through and remain lethal for a considerable distance. In some circumstances, an injured bison will not permit the shooter to approach from behind and will strive to face the threat head on. In this case, place the bullet 3.5 to 5 centimeters above an intersection of two lines drawn from the base of each horn to the opposite eye. With the imaginary target in view and correct shot placement, death should be immediate. Bison that are alarmed or aggressive will often face the threat and stand with their head elevated. Do not attempt
attempt a forehead shot in this case as the bullet will glance off the bone. Draw a line across the animal where its belly and front legs intersect. Then center the shot. This will place the bullet in the heart-lung area and will ensure a quick but not instantaneous death. Bison that are heart shot can still travel a considerable distance, so be prepared to take a second shot. Once shot, the standing bison should collapse immediately. Muscle contraction may occur for up to 20 seconds, possibly followed by some uncoordinated kicking or paddling movements before the muscles completely relax. It is essential to properly confirm the animal's death. Do not approach a downed bison assuming it's dead. If only stunned, it can regain its feet and charge very quickly. Attempt to elicit a response from the animal by throwing rocks or making loud noises. Watch for chest or belly breathing, ear flicking or eye blinking. Any response may indicate sustained or recovering brain activity, and the euthanasia method may have to be repeated or an alternate procedure employed. If no response, approach the down animal from the direction of its hind legs, rifle at the ready. If there is no evidence of movement, approach along the animal's backbone. Watch the eye. Do not assume the bison is dead until you can touch the surface of its eye and it does not blink. All bison managers must know that handling bison may result in a situation where euthanasia will be required. Only those with professional training and euthanasia techniques should attempt to dispatch an animal. This training should not only provide the skills to perform the procedure, but also the confidence to make a timely decision on when to euthanize. If there is any doubt about your marksmanship or your ability to humanely kill the animal, arrange to have someone with those skills on site during the handling operation. This is not a task to be taken lightly. It must be planned and prepared far in advance.